All right, let's see. Is this, how long does this? I'm going to step down here because I like to be short. All right, so teaming with microbes. How many people have read the book? Ooh, okay. How many people have heard me talk before? Oh, that's good. Okay. All right, anyway, I, when I give talks to regular people, I always show this picture because I went to school with the guy with the uh, red suspenders. That's Roger Swain from the Victory Garden. And I like, I have a classmate here who went to school with both of us. I like to say that 1% of my class at Harvard became garden writers, and half of that 1% became successful at it. Um, all right, anyway, um, yeah, I wrote Teaming with Microbes. I also wrote this book, Teaming with Nutrients. I hope you've seen it. And the third book, which will be coming out around Christmas, is Teaming with Fungi on Mycorrhizal Fungi, which I just turned into the editor. And whew, what a relief. Anyway, uh, I have a trilogy now, and that makes me Lord of the Roots, which I think. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, let's get down to business. This happens to be an Alaskan sled dog doing his business. Come on, little humor. Guy. Okay, sorry. When I first started gardening, I'm an old guy. I'm about, what? God, I must be 68 now. Everybody had one kind of phone. They didn't own it. It was black. It stayed in the house when you moved. The phone stayed there, and that was it. You had a black phone or you didn't have a phone, and that was just it. There were tons of magazines and all sorts of gardening magazines. I can't believe how many gardening magazines there were when I was a kid. Uh, there were all sorts of newspapers with gardening columns in them. Uh, unbelievable. We had plastic everywhere. Unbelievable amount of plastic. Uh, we ate plastic. We, we played with plastic. Uh, I showed you that, that little thing, popcorn that was Jiffy Pop. We had aluminum foil came in. We had these new fertilizers that were developed. We learned how to spray our food so that they would be beautiful and no blemishes. Instant coffee was developed. Uh, it was a time that actually had a television show and a slogan, Better Living Through Chemistry. Now, this is, this is Mr. Wizard. Uh, over there on the right, he, he was the guy who hosted the television show, and he had this little dweeby kid with him. And of course, it was better living through chemistry. We learned a lot, and a lot of us kind of took it a little bit further when we got a little older. <laughs> All right, so today, there is no aluminum foil in popcorn. If you gave Jiffy Pop to a kid, they wouldn't know what the hell you were talking about. Uh, this, is, this is what popcorn looks like. There's no aluminum foil in TV dinners. Uh, this is our instant coffee. And we all own a telephone, every single one of us. We carry them around. They have magazines in them and newspapers. And they have a television in it. Unbelievable. Un simply believable. And when we need information today, we can get it anytime and any place. <laughs> you know, the first time I showed this picture, people laughed, you know. And, 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 and uh, I, I remember going through the uh, airport about three, three months ago. This is what you find at the airport now when you're going to the back. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's 2016. <laughs> it's 2016, and we're still using the same old fertilizers. Uh, we're still spraying our food. We're stuck. We're just basically stuck. Easy doing these you know, cute pictures, you know. Uh, we're stuck, and one of the reasons why we're stuck is because we have been brainwashed by this Scottish guy who comes on the television set every spring and screams and yells at us that we've got to start using miracle Grow. Well, you know, it's kind of a strange world. Um, I used to believe miracle Grow was the greatest stuff in the world, and I would go to garden writer conferences, and I would argue with people that it didn't make a bit of difference if your nitrogen came from a brown manure or a green powder. Didn't make a bit of difference. It was still nitrogen, and that's what the plant needed. And I would argue with my fellow garden writers, and they would say, convince me, and I will become the biggest organic gardener you will ever meet. I wasn't going to grow any bigger, but I was going to become a lot more active. Anyway, uh, one day a friend of mine, after about 20 years of this argument, sent me this picture on email. I had no idea what I was looking at. He included the words, the soil food web. And I had absolutely no idea what I was looking at. Now, at the time, this was 1994. I was the longest running garden columnist in the United States. Um, you would think I would know what I was looking at, but I had no idea that this was a nematode. Nematodes are blind. They travel in the soil at a temperature gradient where they're going to hit the food that they eat. And this particular critter was traveling around. Oh, he also put the words, you lose. Uh, he was traveling around, <laughs> and, and, and he smells this wonderful little stuff, and the next thing you know, 
he ends up swimming into those two little lifesavers. And as soon as he gets into that last lifesaver, they both fill up with water and they strangle that nematode. That's a fungus protecting a plant root, killing a nematode. Holy shit, I said to myself. <laughs> I had never seen an electron microscope picture of a nematode or of a fungus. I would never knew that there were fungus that could kill nematodes. I was completely blown away. So what was the soil food web stuff and why did he say I lost? Well, I did a little bit more investigation and I came upon this particular uh, diagram. Now my wife was off getting a, dia a, a degree or something up in, uh, on the East Coast and so I, I spent about 48 hours literally going through the internet trying to find this stuff. I come across this diagram, here I am, the longest running garden columnist in the United States of America and I had no idea what I was looking at. I had never heard the word mycorrhizal fungi. And I just had absolutely no idea, but I did see this 1988 Dr. Elaine Ingham. And she turns out to be a woman who started something called the Soil Food Web, um, uh, which was spelled differently. And the Soil Food Web is depicted here. Now, you all are familiar with, with food chains. The little guy eats the bigger guy, gets eaten by a bigger guy. There are all these food, food uh, uh, chains in the soil and every now and then one of the critters on the chain might look up and see another chain and something it can eat and it grabs it and eats it and connects those two chains. And so eventually what happens is you end up with an incredible web of things that eat each other. And that's what the soil food web is. This is how the uh, system works. And I could give the whole talk off of this slide, fortunately for you I won't. What happens is the photosynthetic energy of a plant, about 50 to 60 percent of it, is used not to produce the bud or the flowers or the trichomes or the roots or the leaves. It's producing things that drip out of the root system into the soil called exudates. Now you're all sitting here now and I am also exudating, sweating. And our exudate does the same thing that these exudates do in the soil. The first thing that they do is they attract bacteria and fungi. So you're sweating and you're attracting bacteria and fungi to your skin. The soil is full of bacteria and fungi and they're attracted to the roots because the exudates contain carbon. And so they're eating this carbon, having a happy time, breeding, eating carbon, and along come nematodes, I just showed you a picture of one, and protozoa, which you studied in high school, and those nematodes and protozoa eat the bacteria and they eat the fungi. They eat them because they need carbon. But they don't need everything that's in the bacteria and the fungi, so they poop out the excess. All of this occurs right in the rhizosphere, right at the root system. And that excess poop contains plant usable nutrients, particularly nitrogen, which is absorbed by the plant because it's right there in the root zone. So the plant attracts the organisms that in turn attract organisms that eat them and feed the plant. Wow. What a system. And then, of course, you've got the bigger guys all the way on up uh, that eat and make things smaller and smaller. So eventually, the bacteria and the fungi get it. Holy crow, I said to myself in 1994, who knew? I had absolutely no idea. And when I went to the garden writers meeting the following year and I asked people, how many know what a mycorrhizal fungi is? From the New York Times to the lowly Anchorage Daily News, not one of the 750 garden writers that were there knew what a mycorrhizal fungi was. And only two of them had any inkling that this was going on. And I was one of them. Oh, wow. So if you don't know about this stuff, it's because nobody knew about it. So I'm going to give you a short course on the soil food web. This is something, I, I, in an hour you will know everything you need to know. Do not take notes. I guess this is how people take notes for two reasons. One, you're going to understand it. Trust me, this is simple stuff. And two, Buy the book, for God's sakes. <laughs> you know, all right, sorry, let uh, me just have to, you know, be shameless. And if you want to buy it in Korean, you can, or in Dutch, you can, or in French, you can. I don't have copies of the Slavovian one, uh, and there's two other languages. Polish is coming out. I don't know, it's in all these different languages. Who knew that the world was interested in this stuff? Anyway. Uh, I don't have an electron microscope. I couldn't possibly afford one on the two cents I make off of each one of these books. So you're going to have to look at this through my weird eyes with my weird sense of humor. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to go down into the ground. It's a nice little trip, you know. Um, and once we're there, we're going to learn about the soil food web. So I want you to pretend, for example, that this happens to be the set of roots from a tree in Pioneer Square on a Friday afternoon in the middle of the summer. Here, I'm going to go like this. Okay, so those are the roots underneath by the Pioneer Courthouse in Pioneer Square. And this plant's sitting there, it's Friday, all these weirdos have been running around, dogs peeing on it and everything, and it says, you know, I would really like some Mexican, mm, make that Japanese food tonight. And so what it does is it drips out extra dates into the root system, into the soil, and the next thing you know, it attracts Japanese bacteria. <laughs> now, if the plant wanted to have American food, it just changes the mix of extra dates, and it attracts American food. Simple as that. If it wanted French food, well, you know the, the routine. It can get French food. It's pretty simple. It changes the exudate mix. All right. So the take home is the plant's in control. We think we're in control. But in general, the plant is in control. We tend to mess things up. Now, in addition uh, to dripping these exudates out in order to attract the food that it wants, it also attracts a great diversity and number of microbes. And it's those numbers and that diversity that protect the soil food web system. So, for example, if uh, we were all chickens, uh, you know, or alligators, and there was one chicken in here, you know, it'd kind of be a bad scene for that chicken. <laughs> But if there was a bunch of different things in there, they would protect the chicken and each other. Diversity protects us. I ought to pass that on to Bernie, for God's sakes. But anyway, uh, in addition to diversity, it's also attracting uh, organisms that do other things, like drip out uh, 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 chemicals that protect uh, the, the different organisms that are in the soil, or you get these kinds of extra dates. Now, you remember when you took a biology class or a botany class, maybe you don't remember, there was always this picture of the root, and they talked about the sloughed off cells at the root tip, you know, as the root grows, it sloughs off cells. Well, it turns out about six months ago, they discovered those are not sloughed off cells. Those are actually xDNA. They now call those cells border cells, new name, and the, they look like this when they come out of the root. That's the root with these things coming. And they act like DNA, xDNA, which is the same thing as your white blood cells. And they go out and they eat things. So this particular bunch is eating heavy metals and keeping them in the soil, preventing them from going into the plant. Who knew? These exudates are unbelievable. So they feed the plant, they protect the plant, and they protect the soil food web as well. Um, now, in each teaspoon of soil, you have 500 million to a trillion bacteria. That's what I said when I wrote the book, uh, but when I revised the book, I had to change it because they discovered that in the soil there were this second group of organisms called archaea. Now, nobody's ever heard of archaea. It turns out it's the third branch of life. So you've got bacteria, you've got the animals, you've got archaea. Now, uh, the archaea was discovered in uh, 1979 and it has a different cell wall than bacteria. They look like the bacteria. They didn't realize they were in soil. They always thought they were in hot vents and geysers and that kind of stuff. And then they discovered that they were the dominant organism in the oceans. And then they discovered that they were the dominant organism in the two-step nitrogen fixing process in soils. This was only about 10 years ago. Nobody even knew they were in the soil. There they are. But you know, we're discovering all sorts of low life forms all the time. <laughs> So we're going to have a lot of new discoveries. Um, <laughs> sorry, I hope I'm not offending too many people. <laughs> but if you don't offend somebody, you're not doing a good job. All right, anyway. Uh, so you've got these bacteria and these archaea. You've got 500 million to a trillion of them. They're really kind of cool organisms. They love simple digest things, sugars, the ends of long carbon chains. They eat, and they eat, and they eat, and they breed, 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 breed. I can't show you the breeding pictures because this is a mixed audience. But if you took two bacterium and you put them in a Petri dish under ideal conditions in six months, you'd end up with about 12 feet of bacteria covering the entire earth, blah, 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 blah. All right, anyway, uh, they need water in order to live. Tad mentioned you've got to have water for your soil. It's for the microbes, not necessarily the plant. 
Um, and there's some really cool bacteria. The actinomycetes tend to be a little deeper in the soil than the other bacteria. They form these spectacular looking little colonies. Um, and, and these are the guys that when you put your hand in a Malibu compost and you smell it, because Malibu compost has gone through the entire composting process, you do not smell manure. You smell this beautiful fresh soil and the chemical that's being released is being released by these actinomycetes and it's called geosim. Great crossword puzzle uh, thing. All right, now there are some very special bacteria, the rhizo rhizobia, the nitrogen fixing bacteria. You've all heard about them, you've probably all seen them. Most people have never heard of Frankia, but if you go to any alder plant in Oregon and dig it up, you will see these knobs. These are actinomycetes that are nitrogen fixing uh, bacteria. Uh, and uh, while we can buy rhizobia, you can't yet buy Frankia, but people are beginning to develop products containing it because these are really good for pioneer plants. All right, now the thing about these bacteria that's key to what we do is they produce a slime. They produce a slime in order to stick together and in order to protect themselves. They're coated with this slime, okay? And so when a bad guy comes along and tries to eat them, it, ah, those slime's in my way, and they go away. All right, simple as that. So this slime is key for a couple of reasons. First of all, it has a pH above seven. I'm not gonna go into pH, it was one of those terrible things, you know, in biology. It's not, a, it's not an acid, that's the bottom line. It's the opposite of an acid, it's alkaline, always. So if your soil is dominated by bacteria, the pH is gonna be above seven. Simple as that. All right, the other thing is it's sticky. And not only do these colonies you know, stick to particles, but these particles of soil stick to each other. And you begin to get soil structure as a result of bacteria in your soil. All right, so there are good bacteria. I, that's what we want to have. But obviously there are bad bacteria too. And they are opportunistic. They lurk and hide and wait for their opportunity. Now, there are also fungi in that soil. Uh, in that teaspoon of soil with 500 million to a trillion bacteria, there are a good 14 feet of invisible fungal hyphae. And they look like this. They've got all the body parts that a plant uh, cell might have. Uh, they're really kind of cool organisms. Uh, we're interested in the hyphal, not the yeast ones, although we like the yeast ones because that's what makes beer. But we're interested in these hyphal ones, basically. Um, and you know, you basically uh, all know about Fungi, more or less, okay. Uh, the thing about fungi is we used to think they were plants uh, without chlorophyll. Well, it turns out they're closer related to animals. They contain chitin in their cell walls and like lobsters and crabs and that kind of stuff and a lot of insects. Um, and what they do is they weave through the soil as they move towards their food and they weave together those stuck together conglomerates of bacterially stuck together soil. And these are not blocks like bricks. And so you end up with even more soil structure, with air holes and pore spaces so that when it rains, the rainwater pushes the bad air out, pulls in good air behind it. Reservoir spaces, places for little guys to hide from bigger guys. Soil structure comes from bacteria and fungus. And if you screw up the bacteria and fungus, you're gonna screw up your soil structure. Simple as that. Um, these fungi make mycelium, these wonderful networks, which Paul Stemmis writes about in Mycelium Running. And some of, these, some of these networks literally are 30, 40, 50 miles. Every tree in the forest linked together, talking to each other, and even trees that are not related, different species, all linked together with these wonderful uh, uh, things. And some of these, uh, um, this is the mycelium in the back, in front here are what are known as rhizomorphs. This mycelium, they come together, a wall, a cell wall will fall away, and the next thing you know you have, you have these pipelines that are carrying water throughout the entire area. Unbelievable. These are really incredible. Uh, when you take a handful of soil and put a handful of baby oatmeal into it, put it in a yogurt cup, stir it around, and then put it into a furnace room or someplace where it's warm, leave it there, wipe off the top every uh, twice a day. In two or three days, it'll look like this. 
Because what happens is those individual fungal hyphae, that 14 feet of invisible fungal hyphae, they come together, they form visible mycelium, and they multiply and multiply and multiply. I used to carry this around with me. Unfortunately, the TSA is not fond. And, and they didn't really like it, but I used to carry it around. And what they do, they would pick it up and snip it, and I would just think about all the spores going into the... But I would carry this around and I would take it out at this point in the talk and I would hand it to you and you would t look at it and you would pass it all the way around and it would come back and it would still be the same sponge block that it was when I handed it to him. Because this is where soil structure comes from. You could drop that on the floor and pick it up and it's still exactly like that. Unbelievable. Um, now the thing about these fungi is they can't make their own energy and so they have to travel to it. Uh, they need carbon in order to live, and so they move at great distances. Uh, they digest extracellularly by dripping out all sorts of uh, enzymes. They absorb the food that they uh, break down in the soil, and then they stream it through their cytoplasm uh, and feed themselves. Now, unlike the bacteria, the stuff that these guys drop out causes the soil pH to go down, acid. So if your soils are dominated by fungi, then they're going to be acetic. Bacteria, alkaline. Simple as that. And they break down really, really hard to digest stuff. Bacteria, ends of the carbon chains. These guys can break the middles of the carbon chains. They can break down wood and really, they can break down that truck. There's even a fungi that lives off of creosote. So they're unbelievable at what they can do and break down stuff. There are some terrific above ground fungi, which we're really not going to talk too much about, but you're going to start learning more and more about them, called endophytes. Uh, and these, an endophyte is just a symbiont, a fungal symbiont in a symbiotic relationship uh, that lives in the host for at least part of its life and doesn't harm the host. Now in most instances, it turns out they help the host. Every single plant in the world has at least one and most have over 300 endophytes in them, every single plant in the world. And they're beautiful when you put them in petri dishes and get them to stain. They have some very unusual properties. For example, the endophytes that is in grass can prevent cattle from grazing because they don't like the taste. And aphids from grazing because they don't like the taste. And again, we are beginning to see products being developed from these endophytic fungi, which you'll be using organic products in your cannabis crop. All right, and then, of course, we've got mycorrhizal fungi, which I'm going to talk quite a bit about uh, later on. Um, so let's move on to the protozoa. This is the one that I mentioned in the Oregonian that you all studied in 10th grade and took the diagram home. It looked like the bottom of your shoe, and you had to put the gullet in it. It's a paramecium. You all studied this in 10th grade. I know you did. And this is what they look like today under an electron microscope. One paramecium will eat 10,000 bacteria a day and poop out the excess nitrogen that the plant needs. Um, and this is one that you also studied. Nobody ever really saw it. We always told the professor or the teacher that we did, this is the amoeba. This is what they look like today. And here's one that attacks dogs. Um, all right, so uh, then there are protozoa. Let me go back here for a second here. Uh, yeah, so there's several thousand protozoa in a teaspoon of soil. Uh, 40 to 50 nematodes. Uh, let's take a look at the nematodes themselves. These are true worms. They have mouths, they have anuses, if I can say that. Um, and, and the only difference is, is, is their mouthpiece is different, depending on what they eat. So you can tell whether you have fungal soil or bacterial soil by looking at the mouthpieces of your nematodes, which is something that, you, of course, you really want to do. This particular guy, for example, you know, looks pretty scary. But that's a bacteria eater. Those are just spatulas that wave water containing bacteria into the mouth. Looks like a drill bit, but it's completely harmless. Now this one, on the other hand, has got a little, little needle that acts like a, like a little ball-peen hammer, hits that thing and goes right into the thing it's eating, a fungus, and then it sucks out all the cytoplasm. Um, so it's kind of cool. This one, it causes hookworm. Uh, and that's another one that attacks dogs. And this is what nematodes look like when they attack roots. So if you've got this on your cannabis plants, you get a little problem. <laughs> you have to think about what to do. You can use beneficial nematodes to get rid of it. Um, all right, so this is a picture of a root. This is the rhizosphere. 
And it is incredibly rich in carbon because the soil around it is not. Most soil in an incredibly good organic farm would be about 5% carbon. So around the roots, because of these exudates, you always have good carbon. That's where carbon comes from. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. So what's happening in the soil is this. You have the nematodes and the uh, protozoa eating the bacteria and the fungi, pooping out the excess and feeding the plant. That's how it works. And it turns out that in all instances, when the poop comes out, whether it comes out as a result of eating a bacteria or a protozoa, it's always containing nitrogen in ammonia form, NH4, always. But if the soil happens to be fungally dominated, it stays that way. If it's bacterially dominated, it has nitrogen-fixing bacteria in it, and they convert the ammonium into nitrate. So we've got two kinds of nitrogen. Who knew? And it turns out some plants prefer one over the other. They can live off of both kinds, but they prefer one over the other. Who knew? Not this garden columnist, I can tell you right now. It's just like these you know, clickers for your TV set and your, and your VCR or whatever they call these things these days. You know, the damn thing's supposed to work on both, but the TV clicker always works better on the TV, and the VCR clicker always works better on the VCR, and it's the same thing with plants. They prefer one over the other. So how do you figure out which, what's they like? Well, you can take a look at the general succession scene. You can start at the beach and go to the old growth forest. When you start at the beach, it turns out you have only bacteria, and as you get more and more stuff decaying, the fungi move in. And so by the time you get to the old growth forest, you've got 50,000 more fungi than bacteria. So all you have to do is figure out where your plant is along that continuum, and that's what you give it. Not so easy because it's a stupid picture. So we came up with this idea. Uh, <clears throat> bacteria, things that like bacterially dominated soil, are things that are in the ground for less than a year. So bulbs, annuals, row crops, Cannabis sativa, cannabis indica. Not a perennial, an annual, okay? Self-seeding annual, right? Goes on this side, likes bacterially dominated. Fungal are things that are in the ground for more than a year. Tomatoes, tomatoes incidentally are a perennial, oddly enough. Uh, tomatoes, uh, perennial shrubs and trees. And lawns just happen to like 50-50. So that's the system. And we don't care about anything else except for the cannabis, so it's just back to you. All right, anyway, uh, prepare yourself if you're a little squeamish about putting your hands in the soil because we're going to go a little further here. Uh, there are some really ugly looking things in there. Uh, when you, when you want to know whether you've got the little guys, you have to maybe take a look and see whether you've got the bigger guys that eat the little guys. And you can do this by making something called a Berlaise funnel. It's explained in the book. It's really easy. Uh, and when you do the Berlaise funnel, this is the kind of stuff you end up seeing. Uh, you see mites, and this big guy in the middle is a japajid with these little uh, And uh, there's some springtails there. That little guy, guy over there, the gray thing is a springtail. Uh, they eat fungi, so you know. So what you want to do is you want to be able to identify the bigger guys in your soil. There is a book worth buying by a guy named James Nardi. You can take this one note. It's called Life in the Soil, James, N-A-R-D-I. It is an identification book for things that are in the soil. There are bird identification books. There are snake identification books. Finally, there is a soil life identification book. And it'll tell you what, you've, what you have and what they eat. And then you'll know whether your soils are fungally dominated or bacterially dominated. Um, mites, for example. Great. Some eat fungi. Some eat bacteria. But, but, and they're all over the place. When you do this Brulee funnel thing, your soil has got so many mites in it you can't believe. And there are two basic kinds, orbited and gamacid. And the orbited, they eat, they eat vegetables, particularly dead vegetables. And the gamacid, they eat insects and nematodes. So you want those, but maybe you're not so sure about, but you know. Anyway, the book helps you determine what you want and what you don't want. Springtails, springtails eat fungi. You got them in your yard, you got them in your pots probably. Some are on the soil surface and some are down below, um, and they, they're just spectacular little organisms, and if you can find them, they're fun to look at. I mean, and what's going on in the soil is you've got these guys running around, eating each other, making tunnels 
breeding and making soil structure as they run around in this eat and eat be eaten world. Because that's what's going on. If you're not eating, you better look over your shoulder, you're about to be. Uh, so, you know, you've got all sorts of recycling going on. This eating, you know, keeps the stuff going on in the soil. Uh, so here's a, here's a, a, a mite eating a, an aphid. Uh, here's a spider eating a cricket. Uh, here's the evil rove beetle, which goes around eating. Also, so, God, I'm glad he's still around, you know. All right, anyway. Um, and then, of course, you've got ants that are running around making tunnels in the soil so that when it rains, the bad air gets pushed out by the rainwater, good air is pulled in. Reservoir spaces, little places for people to hide. It's unbelievable. Um, and then you've got sow bugs and pill bugs. These guys, I was telling Tyson who's around here someplace, these guys are actually throwbacks to the ocean. And so what they have to do is they have to circulate their urine so that they're constantly wet. And in fact, they love copper. So if you've got these in your soil, uh, you probably have pretty good copper in your soil. They love copper so much they eat their own dung in order to keep this rare little element around in the soil. Uh, you need copper, incidentally. It's one of the elements. So uh, they're really kind of neat. Uh, and again, if you know what you have, you can find out what they eat. You can tell whether your soil has got fungal dominance or bacterial dominance. Spiders, you know, all parts of the soil food web. Uh, if you want to know some of these bigger guys without, you know, spending a lot of money, you just take a handful of duff, throw it in a bucket of water, and see what floats to the top. And then look at Nardi and identify them. Um, worms, unbelievable. Worms are not native to the United States of America. They're not native, uh, obviously, to Oregon. They were brought here down the Oregon Trail. Uh, they came over with the pilgrims and the ballast and the ships, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, they never really made it to Anchorage, Alaska until about 20 years ago. And I started getting phone calls from people in the summertime, and they would say, holy crap, what are these bumps all over my lawn, and how do I get rid of them? People had never seen worm castings. Well, these worms are unbelievable. Worms are blind, and they hate sunlight. How can they be blind and hate sunlight? But they're blind, and they hate sunlight. And so they come out at night. They have no hands, obviously, but they're able to pull leaves down into the soil, into these burrows that they make. Now, if you were to pull down an umbrella into a hole the wrong way, it's not going to go into the hole. because the And it's the same thing with a leaf. These blind worms with no hands know how to flip the leaf the right way to be able to pull it down into the soil. And these, these unbelievable burrows that they make act as reservoirs, air spaces, pore spaces, blah, 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 blah. They're taxi cabs. They're covered with fungi and spores and, and bacteria. They're moving them around all over the place. They're, they're incredible. Uh, and the reason, these are the, the castings that my people of Anchorage have never seen, the reason why vermicasting is so valuable and why you might want to consider using some is because they contain a higher concentration of the nutrients that are in the soil that goes into them than comes, that comes out. When it comes out, it's concentrated. Ten times more potash, five times more nitrogen. You can read as well as I can. All right, so everything is part of the soil food. Web. Everything is part of the soil food. Even slime mold. Never saw it before. I wrote the book. It was in the book. I gave my first talk in Virginia, and I got stuck in a car in a rainstorm in the hotel parking lot. Fifteen minutes later, the rainstorm stopped. I got out, vomit everywhere. It wasn't vomit. It's slime mold. These are like little amoebas. And out of the blue, they come together and form these, these vomit packages. They look like vomit. I don't know what else to say. And then they move around, and they just unbelievable. Uh, all part of the soil food web, you know, we know what bears do in the woods, right? Now, this is my window in Anchorage, Alaska. And if you look carefully, you'll notice that the window is open. What we've got here is a screen. Oh, I'm sorry, we've got to go back to that. One time I even saw, one time I even saw a pair of palins outside my window. All right, <laughs> terrible joke. Um, all right, let's go on to the beetles. Uh, sorry, wrong beetles. Uh, dung beetles, unbelievable. They are incredible organisms, uh, and they're very, very important. Uh, they, they are protected in all, all sorts of places, England in particular. Um, these guys have the ability to jump on a pile of dung, form a ball, roll the ball in a straight line right into their den, right into their little hole. How do they do it? Nobody knew until about a year and a half ago. They discovered that they used the Milky Way for navigation. And how did they discover it? 
they put these funny little things on their heads. Can you imagine explaining to your thesis advisor what you want to do? <laughs> anyway, uh, they're unbelievable. Uh, uh, when, they, when they jump into a pile of dung, they carry with them these little red things are mites. The mites hop off and kill the fly larvae, which are the competition to the dung beetle. And then when it's finished and it's starting to roll the ball into the den, the little mites just hop back on again and they're carried on to the neck. It's unbelievable. They are just incredible. And they're very, very important. They did not have dung beetles of their proper kind. They had kangaroo dung beetles there in Australia when they brought the first bits of cattle over. And they ended up with shit everywhere. I mean, and it's a very difficult thing to clean up. I mean, it really is a problem. <laughs> And so what had to happen was somebody had to figure out, we don't have dung beetles, went to Africa and brought back some elephant dung beetles, and that's what took care of the problem. And so today in Australia, we've got nice green grass instead of brown grass. Uh, everything is part of the soil food web. When a bird touches the ground, protozoa are deposited. When they fly around with a worm in their mouth and they see another bird and they want to talk to it, they drop the worm, you know, and the worm is, the, they're taxi cabs. They're covered with fungal spores and, and, and amoebas and paramecium and all sorts of stuff. And of course, we're part of the soil food web, obviously. And we are not necessarily a good part of the soil food web. And one of the reasons is because we used to use a lot of chemicals. And I probably was one of the biggest chemical users in the world for a reason I will explain to you right now. So you remember that picture I showed you where we eat, we eat plastic? Margarine's plastic. That's, that, that picture uh, is an interesting picture. Um, it has to do with Horace Hagedorn who founded miracle Grow. Horace Hagedorn came to a garden writers meeting and uh, he told us how he founded miracle Grow. He was a, a young graduate from the University of Pennsylvania. He had a degree in advertising he did not go to work for Gillette. He went to work for a butter company in New York City. And so he got there about the second, second uh, hour he was there. He was told all butter is exactly the same. It's all USDA graded. The only difference is the package. It's all the same, absolutely all the same. And he looked at himself and he went, what the hell am I doing here? How am I going to advertise something that's all the same? And he thought about his friend in, 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 in Gillette. You know, and in the morning he would wake up and he would shave, he told us, and he would, with a blue blade, you know, and then a double blue blade, and then a triple blue blade, and he would think about killing himself because he wished he was working at Gillette, but he didn't want to, you know, make a mess for anybody to clean up. He would drive to work, he told us he would think about driving into another car. He hated his job so much, but he didn't want to kill anybody. So he would spend his weekends trying to calm down and clear his head, and he would drive around, and one day he comes upon a nursery in New Jersey owned by a guy named Otto Stern with beautiful plants in it. He talks to Otto. Turns out Otto has a secret formula that he developed at Rutgers University, and Horace says, hey, maybe you and I ought to go in the business. I'll advertise it. So they decide to try it, and he puts an ad in the New York Herald Tribune, 1953, Sunday, sports section, before and after tomato plant. You know, the miracle grow before and after. And sure enough, the next thing that happens, by the following Thursday, he's made 20,000 bucks in cash in the mail. $20,000. This is more than he's making at the butter company. So he gets in his car, he drives to work, he walks into the butter company, he says to the butter company people, you know, I love butter, but I hate this job. I like you guys, but I hate this job, and I quit. And he told them, I'm going to go on and I'm going to make this fertilizer. And so he did. And uh, then he explained to us how you know, he was producing this stuff, he became very successful. One day, Scott's Lawn Food came to him and said, we're buying you out. And he said, no, you're not. And they said, yes, we are. And in the matter of seconds while they were trying to buy him out, he flipped around and for or $360 million in miracle Grow stock, bought Scott's right out from underneath him. Holy crow. Well, anyway, he tells us the story. We're pretty impressed. He gives us all a box of miracle Grow. You know, we're all sitting there listening to him. He's about this big, little guy. And so afterwards, we all go up to get our autograph, you know. And I'm standing there in the back, and he looks at me, and he goes, uh-oh, is your name Lowenfels? I go, yeah. Turns out my father and grandfather owned the butter company. <laughs> and it turns out that while he was there, the only thing he did was he came out with a margarine, because you had to have margarine, and he put my picture on the package. <laughs> That's me. It's still on the package. I hate Miracle Grow. 
it was a difficult life as a kid growing up, I have to tell you. But, so I'm the only guy in the world that can badmouth Miracle Grow and not get sued because I can sue them. Um, it works. The stuff is phenomenal. It absolutely works. There's no question about it. But the reason why it works is because it's so heavily concentrated that just a teeny little bit of it needs to touch the root system. The rest of it goes down to China and forms that, you know, that dead zone that, that uh, uh, Tad was talking about down in Mississippi. Now, we won't pick a miracle girl. It's all the same. These guys are all salts. And if you learn anything in biology, you learn nature loves an equilibrium. So if you have salt outside of a cell that's full of water, what happens? The salt moves into the cell to dilute the water. The water moves out of the cell to dilute the salt. And you end up with a near equilibrium. It's never an equilibrium. If you read teeming with nutrients, there's always one molecule off on one side or the other. But anyway, you end up with this near equilibrium in a dead cell. It's just blown up, simple as that. Um, and so, uh, you know, instead of having this, you end up with no fungi and the nematode gets into the tomato root and ruins the tomato. So, what's happened is, when you start using these chemicals, you kill off these delicate little guys at the bottom of the soil food web, you end up with no more nitrogen fixation because you've killed off nitrogen fixing bacteria, you've killed off the mycorrhizal fungi, or you've created a situation where the plant says, hey, I'm getting miracle grow. I don't need to spend the energy to produce the exudates to get fed. So I won't, because some gardener's feeding me, and I can get it cheaper, less energy. And so you end up with all of the problems associated with no mycorrhizal fungi, which we're going to talk about in a couple of seconds. Um, you have dependency, disease, problems as a result of using chemical fertilizers. And of course, that's not the only thing we do wrong. You know, we do other stuff to the garden instead of using just chemicals. So you think this woman's still alive today? I guarantee you this woman died of cancer, without question. And probably about two days after this picture was taken. But the other thing we do, we, we rototill. You know, we love to rototill in America. Uh, you know, big garden, little garden, doesn't make any difference. You rototill. I don't know if you're like me. You know, you rototill like crazy. You rent a rototiller in Anchorage, Alaska. Okay, and so you get it for four hours, and you get it, and the first thing you do is you rototill this way, and then you rototill this way, and then this way, and that way. You got three hours and 40 minutes of rototilling, and the soil is like unbelievably soft and fluffy. You can put your arm into it up to here. You got to take the rototiller back, and so you say to the spouse, listen, do not go in that garden because I want it fluffy when I, I'm not even going to walk in the garden. And when you get there, you plant in your garden very carefully, and the next thing you know, it rains. <laughs> or maybe it snows, you know, and you end up with a bad situation. Now, the reason why we wrote hotel is because of this guy. Let's see if I can get the word. <laughs> Jethro Tull, right? Okay, well, Jethro Tull, it turns out, was an English. Oh, sorry. Jethro Tull was an English attorney, and uh, he thought that plants ate their food. Everybody did back then. It was called the Humus Theory. They thought that plants ate their organic minerals. And so what, what he thought was, well, gee, that's great. If they eat organic minerals, if I pulverize them, it'll be easier for them to eat them. And he invented rototilling. Now, this was the time when Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Ben Franklin, the American founding gardeners, George Washington, they all read Jethro Tull. And they all rototilled. And it worked. And why did it work? Because we had old growth forest, fungally dominated. But we wanted to grow row crops and cotton, which require bacterially dominated. So when they rototilled the primeval forest, they turned it into a bacterially dominated situation because they broke up and destroyed the fungal situation that was already there. And it worked. And we still wrote it till today because it worked back then. The truth of the matter is when you wrote till, what happens is you take a worm and you cut it in half. And you don't get two worms. You get two halves of a dead worm unless you hit it at the 18th segment, in which case you get half of a live worm and half of a dead worm. The bacteria that's supposed to be up here is down here. 
That fungal network that's throughout the garden, whether it's bacterially dominated, it still has a fungal network, gone, completely destroyed. Insects chopped up, all sorts of things. And then it starts to rain, you walk on it, it snows, your dog walks on it, the moose roll in it, and the next thing you know, things start to go anaerobic. You get anaerobic pockets in the soil. When you have anaerobic pockets in your soil, alcohol is being produced. One part per million alcohol touching a root hair kills it. So it's not good. And what happens is those opportunistic bad guys, they say, ah, now is my chance. And they come out. And the next thing you know, you have a terrible, terrible case of toilet paper flipperophorus. This is my house, my 14-year-old daughter. I had a lot of friends. The boys came over. She's now 38. Well, next time she comes to the house, her kids are eight and five. They will be helping me still pick up the eight acres of toilet paper. <laughs> they went to McDonald's. I don't know if you know this, but at McDonald's, they have rolls of toilet paper that are this big. <laughs> Phew! Anyway, uh, you know, but you could have had other diseases. It wasn't just, you know, I could have had a case of uh, Ted Cruz spittle, spittle bug. Oh, God, I'm sorry, you know. Or I could have had, uh, you know, <laughs> Hillary Clinton morphologist disease. Anyway, but I ended up with toilet paper flipper offers. Doesn't matter what you get, you end up, you know, figuring, what am I going to do? And so you go, uh, you know, to Lowe's or Home Depot, you know, because you don't have a roots nearby, and, and you ask the genius there, what do I do? Now, I, personally, if you walk into an Ace or a True Value, you can close your eyes, even a Lowe's or you can close your eyes and find the section that you're looking for because it stinks. You know, of course, he doesn't know what to do. So he asks the supervisor, and of course, she doesn't know what to do either. So you just buy the stuff. Of course, you read the label, you suit up, and you start spraying very carefully. Bullshit. Nobody ever reads the label because you have to take a razor blade and pull her open to be able to read it. And mm, you guys are all getting to be, some of you, that age where it's too small print to read. And who suits up the spray? You know, and of course, what happens is you end up spraying the beneficials as well as the bad guys, and it's a slippery slope, and things get worse and worse and worse. You know, and what do you do? You just can't <laughs> figure it out. So anyway, there is a solution, but of course, you know, you, you don't think about it because you don't want to have a blemished apple or a blemished tomato or a, a pot plant that doesn't look great. You know, and so you start to use chemicals and. The chemicals on the lawn keep the dogs off? Oh my God, I mean, you know, what about the kids? There is simply no question about these things. The reason why the Oregon Health Authority and everybody else is having the shit fit over pesticides and herbicides is because they're bad, they're terrible, they're awful, they're shitty, they're killing us. And that's why they care about it, because they don't want us to... to be. And. I'm killing myself because when I, when I got up this morning, I went to a store on 23rd and I bought a little teeny bird. And I was just going to, you know, stick it right there, you know, get that little Bernie clap. But chemicals are, are, are okay, but pesticides and icides that kill us have no place whatsoever in what we're doing. We know it, and yet we have our heads in the, in the sand. So we wonder, you know, why one in nine women has breast cancer. I'm here to tell you, I gave my wife breast cancer. I gave my wife breast cancer. I told her and all of my readers to use 23 different chemicals over the 40 years that I've been writing my column that have been removed voluntarily by the companies. One of which was a, a chemical called Saigon 2E that the Rose Association told me I could use. You'd put a little teeny bit of it on a paintbrush and you put it around the base of a rose stem and it killed the aphids. It was systemic. And we would use it in Anchorage, Alaska on our birch trees. The first time I used it, I had a styrofoam cup. I filled it up with Saigon 2E. I turned around to get the paintbrush, and the cup was gone. I still used it. I gave my wife breast cancer. No question about it. Do not use these chemicals. Um, all right, so what do you do? You know, it gets to the point where even the moose are on their knees praying that you stop destroying the soil food web. I hope I'm not offending anybody. These happen to be Muslims.
Anyway, so the answer is really simple. You put the microbes back, and there's four basic ways to do it. Okay? The first way is you use good compost. The second way is you use good compost tea. That's a kiss machine, incidentally. Yes? Yes. Uh, the third way is you use mulches. And the fourth way in the appropriate situations is you use ecto and mycorrhizal, endo and ecto mycorrhizal fungi. All right, let's start with compost. In Seattle, you have to compost. In Portland, I guess you sort of have to compost. They'll pick up the compost every week. Your trash, they only pick up every other week, which is kind of interesting. But the reason why compost is so important, in addition to being sustainability situations, et cetera, is because compost contains all of the fungi and all of the bacteria, which are the fertilizer bags, and all of the protozoa and all of the nematodes, which are the fertilizer spreaders that you would ever need. That's why compost works, because it's got the working soil food web in it. And if it's not good compost, then it doesn't have that soil food web in it. If it smells bad, it's not good compost. If it's anaerobic, it's not good compost. So you're going to have good, good compost. And you don't need to use very much of it. If you just put down an eighth to a quarter of inch of compost on the surface of your garden or on your pots, it ends up that the soil food web works that stuff into the soil by itself. And after about six months, it's down 18 inches. So you don't have to rototill it in. It's going to get in by itself. Now, there's some problems with compost. The first is you're going to have to have a spouse to turn the pile for you. <laughs> that is my wife, and this is a picture from the book. And, and I didn't get her permission to use it. And I spent about a week on the couch as a result, I have to say. But the other thing is if you have a big garden or a big farm or a lot of pots, you need a lot of compost. And the most important thing is you have to know where your compost came from because there's a lot of bad compost out there. Just ask the folks in Washington State four or five years ago who used compost that they got that had chlorophyll, whatever that stuff is. It killed off trees. It destroyed entire farms. You've got to know what's in your compost. If it's got tetracycline in it because the person is feeding their horses tetracycline, you've got to know that it's been all composted so that when the pot plant grows up through the tetracycline, it doesn't get tetracycline on the leaves, and someone who smokes it gets tetracycline, and they're allergic to it. So you've got to know what's in your compost. That's why you buy good biodynamic compost. Or you go to a place like Roots, or you go to a place like the Keep It Simple uh, Nursery, and you buy good stuff. Vermicompost, we've already talked about it. We know why it's good. Um, but again, you've got to make sure it's good. And when you use compost, basically, you don't really have to use anything else. You'll have gardens you can crow about, you know? Uh, no question about it. This is a good friend, George. Everybody knows George, don't they? Uh, well, you know, around a couple of starter plants, I guess. You know. <laughs> All right, now the other thing about compost tea is you can make fungally dominated compost tea and bacterially dominated compost tea, and it sticks to leaves where it outcompetes other things for space and for food. Okay, so. It, 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 there's no room there for the bad guys. There's no room for the powdery mildew to take hold. So you can spray it on your plants, and you can, you can spray it, obviously, as a soil drench. It's easy to make. Uh, it's easy to buy. Uh, there's many different kinds of brewers. The ones that I suggest, and I would suggest this even if Tad wasn't here, is the Kiss Brewer. The reason why I like the Kiss Brewer is because it can make tea in 12 hours, even though I like to go 18. I like that because when I come home on Friday and I want to put tea down on Saturday, I can make it Friday and put it down on Saturday, as opposed to most of the other brewers, which I have to make it on Friday, then I put it down on Sunday. Well, it might be raining on Sunday. There may be a football game on Sunday. My wife might not know that I was waiting for Sunday to put the cup. So I like the Kiss Brewer. They're also inexpensive, and the KISS people have spent millions of dollars. Well, okay, hundreds of thousands, maybe thousands. They spent money testing the system so we know they work. Uh, you can make your own big, gigantic systems if you want. Compost tea is great stuff. Um, lots of different systems, different sizes. KISS does little guys, big guys, 27, 150, whatever you need. They make it so. Uh, now, lately, people have been using compost extracts as well. Compost tea, you sometimes put little foods in it, you brew it for 24 hours, 18 hours, 12 hours, 
and you multiply what's in it. But if you take your compost, and it's good compost, and you soak it in water and squeeze it and knead it for 15 minutes, you won't get the multiplication, but you'll get a lot of the base that'll come out. So you can use a compost extract as well. Um, you know, some people think they're actually better because they take less effort to make. I don't. Uh, does compost tea work? Very controversial, particularly in Washington State because of Linda Chalker Scott, who's an uh, extension worker who doesn't think they work, but here it is, before and after in South Africa. There's Dr. Elaine Ingham's old office. Look in the back, you can see the spot that wasn't compost teed. This is the shed aquariums, roses, and there are some potatoes. Uh, I love to show these pictures of uh, John and Mary uh, uh, Evans in Alaska. Uh, the reason why I show this picture is because that zucchini on the, on the right-hand side, I took to the Flower and Garden Show, it was 49 pounds. So, you know, you fly Alaska Airlines, you're only allowed 50 pounds in a bag, so I had to take more than just a piece of underwear. So I had to have a separate bag just for the And I took it into the Seattle show, I opened up the bag, and there's a note from the TSA, you know, that little thing we've been through your luggage, and hand stapled on it, a handwritten little note that went, holy shit. <laughs> Four, I mean, unbelievable. That cauliflower there, I think is 27 pounds. I don't know how big the leak is. All he uses is compost and compost tea. That's all John uses. He has like, you know, 14 Guinness Book of Records, et cetera. Uh, but this is the crowning. This is the crowning one because I went, I went to Harvard, I'm ashamed to say. It was the only school I got into, so I had to go there. Um, but when I went, and, and Michael Wallace was my classmates here. When I, when I went to, I think it was my 25th reunion, I took team with microbes. And I had the only copy. It had just, you know, they'd given me the printer's copy. And I put it on the table with, you know, all these famous people in my class with all their books and everything, and everybody came up and laughed at me. They were, oh, I love that little stupid fun book. <laughs> Went back five years later to the next reunion. Guess what? The entire Harvard Yard, when you park your car there, you're parking your car in a compost teed yard. Because what happened was, Harvard adopted the system. Not only did they adopt the system, they compost now everything they can campus so that they have enough compost to be able to put compost tea now. This is the president of Harvard University speaking to Terry Fleischer uh, about his project and the compost tea that's going down. But Linda Shocker Scott says it doesn't work. Tell that to the president of Harvard University. Anyway, uh, so you can make compost tea, fungally dominated, bacterially dominated. Next, you can have mulches. Mulches can be bacterial mulches or fungal mulches, okay? Really simple. If you have green things, they generally have sugars on them, and those are bacterial mulches. Brown things generally don't, and those are fungal mulches. And if you take brown things and really grind them up, make them really small, they open them up for bacterial, so you can turn a fungal mulch into a bacterial mulch. Uh, so brown for fungal, green for bacterial, pretty simple. What falls down from a plant is supposed to stay there. That's how the plant feeds itself. There's something called the law of return. If you read my second book, we disrupt the law of return by cutting the plant, taking the flowers, taking the leaves, taking the stalk out of the soil. Anything you can put back down in the soil again, you should. So if you're not using those leaves to make something, put them back in the soil or in your compost and then put them back down again. Um, all right, so no bare soils, no bare soils in nature. You use the right kind for the right, right purposes. And ectomycorrhizal and endomycorrhizal fungi. Now, I just finished a third book on it. When I wrote the first book, I put about a paragraph on mycorrhizal fungi. I had to do the revised edition and put a chapter in it. And it just came, it just came to me that we need a book on, on mycorrhizal fungi because they are so important. It turns out that 90 to 95 percent of all plants form a symbiotic relationship with a fungi called a mycorrhizal fungi. And they are key to life on Earth. And there was a tremendous number of misconceptions up until about five or six years ago, which led people to believe that they were ubiquitous, you didn't need to use them because they were there already, and they really didn't really work all the time. Well, now we've figured out a lot more about them. It's all in the second book. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about them now. Uh, there are about seven different kinds of mycorrhizal fungi as far as we're concerned. Look at this, two of each. 
We only care about these two, the ecto and the endomycorrhizal fungi. Why haven't you heard of mycorrhizal fungi? They were discovered in 1895, thereabouts, at the same time that the fungal chemical industry was being developed. And so they won, and the fungicide industry lost. We also haven't heard of them because it turns out that if you're feeding the plant phosphorus and nitrogen, the plant says, screw this fungi stuff, I don't need them. I'm getting the stuff for free. And so they don't form mycorrhizal associations. And so a lot of people didn't understand that. And when they went to do their PhD theses on plants with mycorrhizal fungi and couldn't get the right results, it turns out it was because they were using too much phosphorus and too much nitrogen in the soil. Well, things have changed quite a bit. We know a lot more about them. Here's what you need to know. First of all, it's mycorrhizal fungi. That's an adjective. Mycorrhiza is the relationship. It includes both the root and the fungus. And in plural, it's called mycorrhizae. Okay. And the reason why I point that out is because look at this. Two of each. I don't understand what's going on here. Uh, oh, boy. I hope this doesn't happen all the way through. So this is a fungus, and this fungus is active. If you look down at the bottom and you move up, you see that little white spot. That's called the spritzenkropper. It's like the brain of the fungus. And, and the spritzenkropper literally is a control room. It tells the fungus where to go. These fungus can go 40 microns a, a minute. It's really pretty fast. Uh, it tells them where there's food. It tells them you know, what to do. Bring up you know, molecules from the back and help me grow. So here's a fungi, and it's, it, you know, it finds out what it wants to eat. Uh, and it moves towards it, and it grows. And the ectofungi, they form these beautiful sheaths around the roots. That's what the brown and the silver, I mean the gold is. Those are roots covered by fungi, and that's just on the outside. But inside, they form what's known as a hartig net, in between the cells. And they take food from the soil, and they bring it in through the sheath into the hartig net, and they transport it into the plant and take the exudates from the plant. They're gorgeous. Uh, they also help protect the plant uh, from bad guys getting into the roots. You can imagine a nematode trying to get through that cottony stuff over there. Down here at the bottom is a ponderosa pine. The fungi are the green, I mean the blue and the uh, white. The root is in the middle of it. These are the trees that have the ectomycorrhizal fungi, all the nut trees in, in particular. Um, there are a lot of ectomycorrhizal fungi that you see. Mushrooms generally, uh, not all, but a lot of the mushrooms you see are the fruiting bodies of the mycorrhizal fungi that are feeding the plants in the vicinity of those mushrooms. Truffles are mycorrhizal fungi. Um, and, and, and the mycorrhizal fungi that, that are mushroom, mushroom forming are all ecto. They're all visible. They all form a fruiting body that you can see. The endomycorrhizal are known as vesicular arboruscular mycorrhizal, or BAM. These are the ones we're interested in when we grow cannabis. Uh, they form these beautiful little microscopic tree-like structures. Um, and uh, these tree-like structures are where the fungi uh, do some of the transferring. And they also form these little round vesicles, which contain liquids, where there's also more transfer that takes place. They're invisible, the endo. You have to stain the plants in order to be able to see them. Um, this is one of the vesicles. Those vesicles contain liquid. During a drought situation, that liquid is available to the plant. And so farmers have learned in, in, in Illinois during the drought three years ago to use mycorrhizal fungi because they get a crop. Without mycorrhizal fungi, the crop dies. So there's the ecto with the, with the mushroom, you can see. There's the endo, which you have to stain in order to be able to see them. One of the situations where size really matters because these guys are so much smaller than root hairs that they have the ability to be able to go places a root hair can't. So a plant grows, develops a root. The root goes into the soil. The root absorbs what's in the soil in the contact zone between the root and the soil. So you get osmosis and all that kind of stuff. But then you end up with a depletion zone. So the plant has a choice. It can either grow deeper into the soil and get new stuff to mine, or it can associate with a mycorrhizal fungi, and the fungi can go out beyond the depletion zone and bring back all sorts of goodies, in particular phosphorus, nitrogen, copper, and zinc. In particular, phosphorus. It's the mycorrhizal fungi 
that lock, that unlock the phosphorus in your soil. When you put phosphorus, the middle number, on your soil, it locks up chemically in a nanosecond. And it's very, very hard to get into the plant. The mycorrhizal fungi make it very, very easy. Phosphorus, it turns out, we are reaching peak. We're going to have no phosphorus in about 20 years. It's going to be a big problem. When you go and buy lawn food in the United States of America this year, you will not find any phosphorus in lawn foods anymore. No middle number in Scott's lawn food because we're running out of it. Mycorrhizal fungi go out and get it out of the soil. You don't have to worry about running out of it. So there are three miles of fungi, uh, mycorrhizal fungi, sometimes in a little teaspoon of soil. You can see how they extend the reach of the plant. Unbelievable. Uh, the surface area increase is phenomenal. And these are all dripping out uh, uh, enzymes and bringing in nutrients into the plant. Um, these are the ecto, I mean, so endo. Uh, and they form this little sort of this network, the subway system, wherever they are, that mycelium. Uh, so here's my subway network in my yard. Now, they don't live very long. They're about two or three weeks, they begin to die off. Branches of them live, but branches of them die off. And when they die off, they leave these little tunnels in the, in the soil that act as a reservoir system for your soil. It's beautiful. And they also contain lots and lots of carbon. So they're there adding carbon to your soil and making carbon available to other members of the soil food web. 90 to 95% of the plants have them. Cannabis sativa definitely does form an association. The ones that don't are the things that kids don't like to eat, like cabbage, you know, uh, broccoli, the coal family, beets, um, and et cetera. They are microscopic, generally. Um, you have to put them in a media to, 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 to make them work. You use them when, when you earliest possible point you can. I like to roll my seeds in them. Whenever you do any transplanting, you roll your transplant roots so that they come into contact because the exudates, I mean, the uh, mycorrhizal fungi have to come into contact with the plant exudate in order to germinate and grow. The plant initiates it. And this happens to be the mycorrhizal fungi that you would get for a cannabis plant, which we will go to. So here's how it works. So you've got two, two seedlings. These are two cannabis seedlings sitting out in the sun. And one of the seedlings says, geez, you know, I'd really like some duck. So it goes and it mixes up the right exudates. It, it, you know, these exudates, by the way, they are carbons. Uh, they're, they're protein sometimes. Vitamin D3 is one of the exudates. Uh, anyway, puts the exudates into the water, catches the mycorrhizal fungi, and the next thing you know, the fungi goes out and gets the duck and feeds the plant. Okay? And the cool thing is, once it's established it, if you haven't come along and ruined the relationship by rototilling, by putting on too much nitrogen or too much uh, uh, phosphorus, the plant continues to grow because the mycorrhizal fungi feeds it. Okay. And what's really cool is if you've got two plants sitting next to each other, they will share their mycorrhizal fungi network, which is really unbelievable. Um, and when you have a mother tree die, all of its nutrients go down into its mycorrhizal system to the daughter plants all around the place. God, nature's incredible. Uh, and do they work? Sure. They do all sorts of stuff. They feed the plants. So generally, you get better looking plants, but not always. You get healthier plants. You get plants that taste better. You get plants that smoke better. They're unbelievable. And they definitely work. And they produce this stuff, the ones that we use for uh, uh, cannabis produce a, a, a special kind of glue called glomalin, okay? Uh, it was discovered in 1996 by the United States Department of Agriculture. Nobody knew what it was. They stained this stuff and they saw this green sticky stuff. Well, that's glomalin. Glomalin turns out to be a very special, you know, uh, protein because it's got a lot of carbon in it. It's got two carbon chains on it. And so as a result, it puts a lot of carbon into the soil. Carbon goes in to the plant. I mean, uh, plant takes the photosynthesis, exudate, exudate goes into the fungi, and you get glomalin being produced. Now, this glomalin is used by the fungi to make the fungi more rigid, to solidify some of the filaments, the little thin filaments, and uh, definitely to seal some gaps which are in, in the fungi itself. 
It's key stuff. It's very, very important. Um, and, and what it does is it leaves carbon in the soil. We used to think humic acids was where carbon came from. That's about 13% of the acids, I mean, of carbon in your soil. About 30 to 40% of the carbon in your soil comes from the mycorrhizal fungi that are feeding the plant. So, you know, you're taking stuff away from your, your soil all the time by cutting the plant, taking the flowers, et cetera, et cetera. But the carbon is going into the soil. You're not taking that away. And both the endo and the ecto bring water to the plant. That sheath can hold water in the ecto. The endo has those little vesicles. So this is what happens in a drought situation. You can see the ones that had the mycorrhizal fungi and the ones that didn't. Think about that in terms of your cannabis plants. <clears throat> Does it work? Guess which one had the fungi? Yeah, it works. No question about it. And it deserved an entire book. And it makes, it makes plants stronger, not only by just feeding them good nutrients, but it's got, it's got uh, you know, a chitin in it. And so you get this chitin coating around the roots sometimes as a result of, of this stuff. So it protects the plant as well. Uh, and there, there's some of that protective fungal sheath around there. That's got chitin in it because the fungus contains chitin in the cell wall. Uh, and there's those vesicles. This is where the transfer actually takes place. The interesting thing is that you, you can chop up a root that contains these vesicles. Those vesicles will act like spores and, and help breed the, uh, the fungi, which is kind of cool. So again, drought tolerance. Gee, look at that. Uh, now here is what you want to know. And unfortunately, it's a little bit confusing because they're changing the nomenclature. For years and years and years, there were two Glomus interosides and Glomus mosi. Those were the two of the endomycorrhizal fungi, the only two out of about 350 that's, that seemed to impact cannabis plants. And what they did was they did a genome reading on it about a year or two ago. <laughs> and so as a result, oh God, it's all screwed up. And so when you look at uh, the labels, you will see any of these words. And if you do, that's what you want to use for your cannabis. So it used to be Glomus, now it's Rhizophagus. It used to be Glomus irregularis or Glomus interacides. So confusing. But those, just remember those. That's what you want. And when you buy endomycorrhizal fungi for your cannabis, that's what you want to have. And it makes a big difference. There's no question about it. You want to use it as soon as you possibly can. Roll your seeds in it. Mix it in your soil so that the roots grow into it. So that you get all sorts of colonies being created all the time as the roots grow. Uh, so you're infecting your plant, you're introducing, you're multiplying. And as far as I'm concerned, obviously good soil is the most important thing you can have for your crop. But the most important thing you can add to good soil, which has already got a great soil food web in it, is mycorrhizal fungi. You will not find mycorrhizal fungi in compost because there are no exudates to support it. So it doesn't germinate in compost. It turns out that the ectomycorrhizal spores, they'll blow two miles, but not really much more. But the endomycorrhizal spores are so big, they don't blow around, so you got problems. Uh, so you want to pay attention to this mycorrhizal fungi. Trust me, I spent three years reading 150,000 different mycorrhizal papers. And I did it because I came to the conclusion after writing the first two books that this is the most important thing next to good soil, mycorrhizal fungi. So anyway, uh, obviously more on that next year maybe when I come back and talk about the book. So if you're a soil food webby, and you all should be, uh, you've got to use different things, look at life differently, no pesticides. You are feeding the microbes who are feeding the plant. It's microbe food, not fertilizer. It comes in all sorts of forms. Usually it's uh, poop and fish. Uh, here's one that's fish and poop. Um, you know, like Tad, there's no reason to go and buy the expensive stuff to make poop. Buy the stuff that makes the poop. So you go to the feed store. What, is it, what does the cow eat? 
That's how you can get good stuff. And Tad carries it all, and so does Roots. Um, you want to manage the glomalin. You want to manage the mycorrhizal fungi is really what I'm saying. And you do that by keeping phosphorus numbers low, below 75 parts per million. That's like in the, in the trilogy, 10, 10, 10, 10 would be as high as you ever want to go. And there's really no reason to go that high. Go one, go two. You don't need much phosphorus at all. It's already in the soil. Um, and, and you want to make sure that you don't screw around rototilling and screwing up your mycorrhizal fungi because you won't have glomalin if you've got dead, like, uh, dead fungi. If you're going to use fungicides or pesticides of any kind, even organic ones, know how they impact the mycorrhizal fungi. Go to mycorrhizal applications, uh, which is in Grants Pass. You can look them up on the web. They have an entire list of which plants are impacted by which fungicides. Uh, you can use these kinds of foods to generate bacteria. These kinds of foods to generate generally fungi. You can test for the soil food web. There are lots of different places to test. You can go to uh, uh, all sorts of different labs that will do testing. You can buy a microscope, do your own testing. A lot of fun. You can waste a lot of time in front of, in front of a microscope, let me tell you. Uh, particularly if you get stoned and you're looking at a microscope. <laughs> Dear, what are you doing? I'll be down in a minute. You, know. <laughs> uh, so you can look for the bigger guys. If you've got the bigger guys, you know you've got the littler guys. James Nardi's book. I've never met James Nardi, but I get an email from him every now and then. And he goes, thank you. All right, you want to you have recycling going on all the time. You know, we talked about this idea. You're, you're breaking the law of return. You're taking stuff out all the time. So you, you want to have those microbes in there recycling stuff. And you put goods in there, you want those guys breaking it down. So one of the things you can use is straw. If you take a handful of straw and you put it into a bucket of water and stir it two or three times a day, after about two or three days, when you look in it, you will see these microscopic paramecium running around all over the place. You'll see them. Each one of those eats 10,000 bacteria and poops out the excess in the rhizosphere takes about seven or eight days for them to get down into the area. But if you have a, comp a tea made out of this stuff, whew, it's terrific. So if you make a compost tea, you can put this in at the end. Or you can just make your own uh, protozoa tea. It's really simple. Uh, you can have little protozoa tea kits. Uh, if you've got a dispensary and you sell clones, you could be selling this stuff. Uh, I love the idea of being able to sell a little baggie of stuff that's not weed. OK, anyway, um, straw. So not convinced. This is, this, is, this is the end of the talk, folks. Not convinced, I just want you to think about this. The redwoods, they are 500 years old. They're 375 feet tall. How did they ever get that way without any miracle grow or any eyesight sprayed on them? They teamed with the microbes, and you definitely should too. Anyway, thank you very much. You're a great audience. And you just graduated from the Teaming with Microbes course. Don't forget to pick up your textbook outside here. And if you need my email, there it is. I love to do weddings and bar mitzvahs if you ever need a talk. If you have a dispensary, you need to be carrying the book. And if you have any questions, you can ask me. And do we have time for one or two now? OK, we're too late. That's my email. I answer all questions. Thank you. And thank you, Amy, for everything Amy does. How about a round of applause? Hey! Before she takes it, so one day my, my wife says to me, you know a woman named Amy Margulis? My, my, my friend who I walk with all the time and play bridge with and do all this, Marjan with her mother. My mom. <laughs> <laughs>